So thanks, uh, Luciana, for inviting me. Um, so um, first thing um, I should say, this talk is, uh, um, it's not the, uh, has a different title and the topic is different from the one that was uh, initially advertised. Um, it's not going to focus so much on the work of uh, Robert Brandon, um, as I hope to, but more on the, on the work of Wilfred Sellers. Uh, on whom I'm writing a book. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, I hope that, you know, the, uh, some of the things I say or that I'll be discussing will be relevant to the, uh, the central topics of the workshop. Um, although, I mean, I should say from the outset, I'm not, I'm by no means, you know, an expert on, uh, computationalism and robotics or artificial intelligence. And I think, uh, Giuseppe Longo and you want to cite both know about those two things far more than I do. So this is more like a kind of a warm up for their interventions. And I think that some of the things uh, that I say now will probably be fleshed out in more detail by Johan Seibt in her talk. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to begin by uh, focusing on the uh, two aspects of the mind. Um, the Brentano thesis famously says that intentionality is the mark of the mental. Um, so in order to understand the mind, we have to um, characterize uh, minds as intentional systems. Uh, and then the puzzle consists in figuring out what exactly, how to understand intentionality. Um, Kant is credited with a fundamental distinction between sapience and, sen and sentience. And the inferentialist project as developed by, first by Sellers and then by Robert Brandom, is predicated on this fundamental Kantian distinct. These are the two aspects of the mind which map on to, you know, th this distinction can be cashed out in very, in lots of different ways. It's, it's been currently cashed out by people like Duluth, such as uh, David Chalmers, in terms of the distinction between the phenomenal or experiential aspects of mind, which would be sentience, and the psychological or functional aspects of mind, which would be sapience. So sapience is reasoning or ratiocination, whereas sentience is awareness or consciousness. Um, and here then, there's two different kinds of intentionality, okay? Because the intentionality of conceptual thoughts, um, the open what tells called the openness of thought is fundamentally different from the intentionality in sensation and awareness. In other words, to think about something isn't the same as to be aware of something. So then we have so then the problem is articulating these three terms: sapience, sentience, and intentionality. And the question is: is the intentionality of mind rooted in sapience or in sentience? Which of these aspects will be more fundamental. Um, now, phenomenology roots intentionality in sentience and argues that sapience is conditioned by sentience. In other words, uh, a consciousness, conscious experience, is what allows us to have thoughts about things. It, um, it follows that if sentience is primary, the condition for creating artificial minds would be the creation of artificial life. Um, you'd have to create consciousness, sensory consciousness and the full-blooded sense in order to be able to generate the kind of complex, you know, discursive conceptual intentionality which characterizes human beings. Um, but if sentience comes first, artificial life becomes the, the contradiction in turn, as I said. Sentience cannot be algorithmically decomposed according to, hence the hostility and amongst lots of... Uh, uh, and all knowledgers or people inspired by the phenomenological tradition to the computational paradigm in philosophy of mind. Uh, and this, I guess, is exemplified by inactivism yeah, and the radical externalism, radi anti representationalist account of the mind. Um, so, the contrary position, the, the, the position being articulated, I think, developed in an interesting way um, by sellers is the position which roots intentionality in sapien and argues that sentience is conditioned by sapien. In other words, that even our, 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 our sensory experience or sensations of things are conditioned 
by our conceptual capacities, um, which are uh, characterized in terms of rule-governed discursive practice. So this is the basic tenet of inferentialism. Uh, uh, conceptual rationality consists of rule-governed transitions between assertions, um, and that there is such that even our perceptual transactions with the world are rule governed or inferentially articulated. Um, now, what is a rule? Okay, a rule is not simply a causal regu regularity or a dispositional mechanism. It's a normative injunction of the form do A and C, do A asterisks and C asterisks, etc. So rules are normative functions, not causal functions. Um, and this is a crucial difference in understanding um, normative functional functionalism from you know classical causal functionalism. Uh, the uh, the ability to follow a rule or to do something in uh, because of a rule cannot simply be understood as the actualization of a disposition. Um, deviation from a rule is error, whereas causal deviation is malfunction. Reasoners err, but nature doesn't make mistakes. Okay. Um, the an unactualized disposition in a physical system um, is, can always be explained in terms of the, uh, no, the, uh, the non- actuality of the the relevance or the appropriate causal mechanisms that would have um set it you know actualize it now causal function is straightforwardly mechanizable so therefore it's computationally attractable and that was always what you know it function is the uh the kind of the orthodox kind of ideology for i guess classical um computationalism um, it's computationally tractable, although its adequacy as a paradigm for understanding minds has been much contested, principally by waves of anti-representationalist uh, um, ideologues. The other way of saying this is that causal functioning is predictable. Where prediction fails, causal dysfunction is explicable by invoking the intervention of some other causes. In other words, if some system fails to do what you expected it to do, you can straightforwardly explain, you will look for some intervening cause that prevented it from doing this thing. Um, so then the question is, is, is normative function computationally intractable? Is it inherently unpredictable? It's tempting to construe normative functioning's irreducibility to causal functioning as evidence of what can call spontaneity. Call the spontaneity of the understanding, which is, of course, other way of talking about freedom. <laughs> but if we want to avoid a metaphysical reification of freedom, as some sort of supernatural force, we have to find a way of integrating normative functioning within causal functioning. It's not simply enough to say that uh, normative functioning is irreducible to causal functioning. Only this way may we avoid lapsing into a dualism of rules and causes or of the normative and the physical. I think it's precisely uh, you know, my, uh, my interest in Selzer's work is, is, is motivated by the conviction that he um, understood the risks of generating this dualism, which is just a kind of, uh, um, it's not the classical Cartesian dualism, it's not been a classic you know, mind-body dualism or mental-physical dualism. Um, but insofar as a dualism is, as Brandon says, an unarticulated distinction, unless one can explain how rules interact with causes or how rules are embedded in causes, one will inevitably relapse into kind of some kind of dualism. So whether and how normative functioning may be integrated into causal functioning depends on how we understand rule following. Now, this is where the difficulties begin. Um, is it possible to follow a rule without being conscious of the rule, without understanding or intending the rule? Um, either this consciousness of, if, we're, if we have to be conscious of a rule, or if we have to be thinking of a rule in order to be able to follow it, um, then we need a rule to be able to follow the rule. 
Okay. Um, so the you know because the consciousness of the rule will be determined by another rule, which itself presupposes consciousness of it, and we're all on an infinite regress. Um, the alternative is to insist that consciousness of the rule consists in some sort of immediate grasp of awareness of the rule as a rule. But then this comes at the cost of rooting intentionalities in sentience after all, because there's a kind of immediate uh, conceptual, uh, there's a grasp of something as something, conceptual comprehension, um, which is not itself um, articulated by a more fundamental by a rule, which is not itself rule governed. So the challenge for the inferentialist is to give an account of rule following, which does not presuppose some form of original awareness or consciousness of rules. And to do so, we must distinguish between understanding and awareness. Someone can understand how to follow a rule without being aware of what the rule is. This allows us to account for the difference between someone doing something in conformity with a rule, without grasping the, that rule, um, and someone obeying a rule that they have properly grasped. And this is really the distinction between doing something, you know, Dennett, I think, explains this very well in terms of the distinction between doing something for a reason, um, which most animals do, uh, evolution, um, you know, uh, generates uh, motivations, um, for animal behavior, sometimes extremely sophisticated and complicated uh, motivations, reasons for doing something, but those animals are completely oblivious, need not be aware, need not know anything about these world reasons, these uh, motivating factors. So this distinction then between awareness and understanding helps us avoid the circularity whereby consciousness thought is explained by grasping a rule. While grasping a rule is explained in terms of consciousness of. At the same time, it allows us to explain what it is to grasp a rule without resorting to any um, unexplicated notion of awareness. Uh, okay. So, now, Sellers tries to kind of, well, well, you know, well, try to get to grips with this topic in his discussion of language. Right. Um, and the first thing to understand is that the, the a, a game is simply, um, you know, a game is at once a set of rules and a complex pattern of behavior incarnating those rules. Individual moves in the game contribute to the realization of this complex pattern. The structure of the pattern is determined by the ways in which the rules are realized through the succession of moves that constitutes this particular game. Each move in the game realizes part of the pattern according to a rule. But while the pattern is a physical phenomenon, it's tempting to maintain that the rules through which the pattern is realized are not. This is a temptation that must be resisted if we want to avoid this dualism of, uh, of rules and causes. So the, the task is to de-reify rule. Temptation to, to reify them can assume a Platonic or an Aristotelian form. The Platonic variant consists in reifying the rules as ideal structures subsisting independently of the patterns that, in, that incarnate them. The Aristotelian variant consists in reifying them as ideal functions shaping inert physical substrates. To de-reify rules is to see how normative function is embedded in causal function and how logical powers are realized by causal powers. And this last um, uh, specification is crucial. Um, and I think this is really, or this is, I think is what I find particularly fascinating or compelling about Sellers' approach. Uh, he insists that um, uh, logical power, which is to say inferential valence, um, is um, embedded in causal efficacy. So in other words, we have to understand the relationship between inference and causation. Um, um, this is expressed, you know, this is 
uh, this conviction is expressed in Sellers' famous claim that espousals of principle, which is to say rules, are reflected in uniformities of performance. Okay. But what's, what has to be emphasized here is that it's the espousals that are reflected in behavior, not the principles themselves. A principle is espoused through the attitude we adopt towards it. And this attitude cannot be that of intending the rule, since the rule is supposed to be the source of intention. Thus, rule-governed activity cannot be separated from conditioned behavior. So, now, okay, here's a, a quote, first quote from, uh, from Sellers um, about the notion of the, the, the relationship between um, no, rule-governed activity and pattern-governed behavior. Okay. Uh, this is kind of other. I apologize for the length of the quote, but it's, it's actually really, I think, quite helpful. Um, so this is from Some Reflections on Language Games from 1954. To learn pattern-governed behavior is to become conditioned to arrange perceptible elements into patterns and to form these in turn into more complex patterns and sequences of patterns. Presumably, such learning is capable of explanation stimulus res re response reinforcement terms, the organism coming to respond to patterns as calls through being, among other things, awarded when it completes gappy instances of these patterns. Pattern-governed behavior of the kind we should call linguistic involves positions and moves of the sort that would be specified by formation and transformation rules in its metagame if it were rule-obeying behavior. It, uh, the key things we're going to try to understand this distinction between pattern governed and rule obeying behavior, and and the, this is I highlighted the crucial, uh, the, the, the the crucial claim. Thus, learning to infer, i.e., reasoning, learning to reason, learning acquiring conceptual competence, where this is purely a pattern governed phenomenon, would be a matter of learning to respond to a pattern of one kind by forming another pattern related to it in one of the characteristic ways specified at the level of the rule of being use of language by a transformation rule. That is, a formally stated rule of inference. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is um, try to give a cape, well, uh, maybe absurdly kind of condensed summary of the uh, the what I take to be the crucial claim in the uh, Some Reflections on Language Games, which is the uh, the intrication of game and metagame, okay? um, which is also the implication of pattern-governed and rule-obeying behavior. Um, now, Sells makes a distinction between, um, he says there's something interesting, you can define a game, a game is defined by its rules, but the rules themselves are not part of the game. It, you have to know the rule or obey the rules when you're playing the game, but um, you don't state or declare the rules when you're playing the game. It, so in other words, there's a, a, dis, a distinction of levels, and he, he likens this, Sellers models it, or well, the same with BK, he kind of models it the distinction between object language and meta language, even though it's not a linguistic distinction. Um, just as in an object language, an object language consists of first order, you know, discourse about things, about the world. A meta language is the, uh, is the kind of the, the stratum which contains the, uh, the, the rules governing, uh, the proper use or the proper functioning of sentences in the object language. So. Sellers' pardon is the chess. He really used the chess analogy, um, very popular in the 1950s, most I got both philosophers. Um, so here you've you got these two levels. Okay, the lower level is the game level. Think about that as analogous to the object language level. And the upper level is the meta game. Okay. Every game includes its own meta game. Okay. The meta game is the level at which the rules governing 
that the rules that define the game find expression. Um, so um, what sellers will do is they, um, this transition um, between levels is what happens when you um, learn when you actually learn to obey a rule. Okay, so uh, the lower level. Um, simply, did, you know, here you have, let's say, I couldn't find uh, any symbols corresponding to chess pieces. So just assume that these things correspond to a, a, a bishop and a king, okay? So a bishop-shaped piece of wood next to a king-shaped piece of wood. Now, it's important that you can't um, use if any expression such as bishop or king, is in a way is going to be a metagame expression because you need to know the rules to, to understand what it is for something to be a bishop or a king in this, in this game. Sellers distinguishes between perception, reasoning, and action. Okay, So he says that the first, the initial, uh, just as in everyday discourse, okay, we perceive a state of affairs, okay? We perceive um, a water bottle sitting on a table. Um, and then this perception may, um, we see that the, the bottle of water is on the table, and then we say the bottle of water is on the table. This is a language entry transition. Okay? This is when you enter from a non-linguistic state into a linguistic state, okay? There's a, a similar transition from the game to the metagame. There's a language entry transition from perceiving a configuration of bishop and king-shaped pieces of wood on a board to thinking that my king is, is shaped by his bishop. Okay. Um, so there's a transition from the game into the metagame. There's an ascension into a higher level um, where you think you have a you have a, a, a conceptualized thought, which is about these pieces of wood that you are currently perceiving. So this is the first step: the moving from the game to a meta game. Okay. Um, the next step is inference. Okay, moving within the me the meta game. This is an interlanguage game. Any, any instance of reasoning, so any claim such as um, you know, red is a color, uh, crimson is a shade of red. These are intra language moves because you don't need any information about the world. You don't rely on perceptual information to be able to execute these inferences. Okay. Um, so from the, the basic, the rule of the game, if a bishop checks my king interpose a pawn, I make the move to then I must interpose a pawn. Nothing has yet happened. I haven't moved any pieces of wood yet. Okay. Um, the final stage, the certain final stage, is the language exit transition, which corresponds to action, where you have you're motivated by the injunction, interpose a pawn, okay, which makes you do something. You move a pawn-shaped piece between a bishop-shaped piece and a king-shaped piece. Now these, okay, this is a very this is a cartoon version of Ken Sellers' argument, okay? But um, the claim is that, the key claim is that all that is required in order to carry out, in order to, to reason, in order to do something for a reason, or to do something because of a rule, as opposed to merely in conformity with a rule, is a kind of practical know-how and not uh, theoretical knowledge, not knowing that. So I think this, it took me a long time to understand this. Okay. But the way in which you avoid the infinite regress, of whereby, you know, if you need, um, if all concept for rule, how can you understand what a concept is without having a rule to follow the rule? Okay, if you needed Either you have, either your ability to recognize the concept presupposes 
that you already have another concept. Okay. And then you have this infinite regress. You need to have a concept of a concept of a concept or a rule for a rule for a rule. Or you terminate the regress by saying, no, you just have this kind of intuitive, you know, preconceptual awareness, which allows you to simply to understand something as something. But then we're back into what Selch calls the myth of the given. The, the, the idea is that things you can have direct preconceptual acquaintance with something as something. That's one version of the myth of the given. Um, you, Sellers turned and solved the problem by saying the transition um, from uh, language to meta language or from uh, gain to meta gain is itself a kind of know how and not knowing that. Okay? You need to know how to ascend from one level to another. And the even at the at the meta level, at the meta game level, all that is ensuring or rather kind of uh, precipitating the transition is practical know how. Okay. There is no so that reasoning, inference is just a kind of practical competence and not necessarily a kind of uh, um, theoretical or kind of you know, theoretical uh, reflection or deliberation. So perceiving a specific configuration of bishop and king shaped pieces of wood as a bishop. So perceiving, sorry, um, a bishop and king shaped pieces of wood as a bishop checking a king, inferring that if one king is threatened by a bishop, it's a bullet pawn, and interposing one's pawn are all rule governed practical competences. Uh, so reasoning is a kind of, essentially a kind of practice, um, which supervenes on certain um, habituation or some kind of uh, basic behavioral condition. You have to be trained to reason, but that training endows you with the capacity to effectuate what seem to be spontaneous um, transitions, okay, as opposed to kind of mechanically ensure um, causal transition. Um, here's okay. I put another quote. Uh, this is this. I think will be the, the last one. Um, from the same paper, words which mention the positions of a game, which is to say position words, are we might say the observation words of a rule language. And in addition to their syntactical role in the rule language, they occur in sentences which come to be occupied as a result of a language entry transition into the rule language, in which transition the stimulus is a situation of the kind meant by the position words. Action and joining context, on the other hand, are the motivating expressions of the rule language. And in addition to their syntactical role in this rule language, they occur in sentences, the occupying of which is the stimulus for a language departure transition out of the rule language to a response, which is an action of the kind mentioned in the motivating context. This is basically Sellers' gloss on the, the, the schema I just uh, tried to show. So, um, the meta game then states the rules governing the game. Thus, competence in the game requires competence in the meta game. The ability to see bishop, horn, and king shaped objects as pieces in the game is a rule presupposing familiarity with the other rules governing relations between pieces. So, in this sense, I think it's worthwhile to say that the meta game states explicitly the rules that are implicit in every movement and position of pieces in the game. You know, uh, hence this is why when you're playing a game, you don't need to state or to conceptually articulate the rules in accordance with which you are playing the game. Um, Moves made because of the rules, okay, and this simply means to make a, a move because of a rule, which is to say that's the only way in which, the only sense in which you can be sensed to be playing the game, this is, or acting for a reason, are unpredictable because they cannot be tracked 
by facts at the level of the object game, or at least this is a, a conjecture. Uh, one way of understanding the unpredictability of sapient beings, of, uh, of reasoners to themselves, um, is because um, there are two, there's a, you know, there's a stratification of levels, and information about the object level will not suffice to help you understand what is you know, going on um, at, the, uh, at the meta game level. Now, this is not to say, or at least it would be very hasty to conclude from this, therefore, that reasoning, or what we call, or, you know, the spontaneity of the understanding, is somehow radically indeterminable or uncomputable. Okay. So I think we'd have to be hesitant about simply saying that this is, in other words, this is a way of understanding freedom um, without any kind of, you know, you know, without any kind of metaphysical libertarian, without postulating some kind of noumenal will. Um, okay. okay. Um, no. But language must enable language users to find their way around in the world and satisfy their needs. So if inferential moves make a difference in the world, like reasoning makes a difference in the world, language must be articulated with the word otherwise than by representing it. Because we can, you know, uh, this inferentialism, um, you know, Sellers and Brandom insist that language does not represent, or meaning rather, meaning doesn't stand for anything in the world. It doesn't designate um, features or properties of the world. So then the question is, how do the rules governing perception, reasoning, and action gain traction on the world? Okay, and here now I'm going to have a, a, f a quick kind of discussion of a, another paper by Sellers called uh, um, Knowing and Being Known, uh, in which there is a, a fascinating discussion of um, whether or not uh, of a reasoning, um, rationality, as, as, as we characterize it, could be mechanically instantiated. Um, but what I want to do, the, the point about this um, is to understand the connection between, on the one hand, well, just the discussion of the relationship between games and metagames, which is the relationship between pattern-governed and rule-obeying behavior, okay. and um, the, uh, let, let's see, the kind of the modeling the kind of modeling of the world that uh, organisms and other kind of, uh, you know, let's say kind of sentient um, systems need to be able to engage in in order to be able to kind of find their way around and do what it is they want to do. Okay. So Sellers, this is a you know, paper written in the early 60s, so it probably is its frameworks may seem anachronistic, but I think the basic point is still very powerful. Um, the robot has a wiring, diag wiring diagram, which determines transformations from senses to other senses in accordance with mathematical and logical principles. Okay. Um, so these would simply be kind of, uh, you know, logical, um, logical inferences of transformation principles. Um, if it's trying to find its way about in the world, in our world, we assume that it would have to have something analogous to a principle of induction. So it would, it, it, it would contain the equivalent of inductive generalizations such that if its tape uh, contains sense pairs such as lightning at ping, lightning at place, um, place one, lightning at time t1, Thunder at place um, plus delta P, T plus delta T. And no sense fares like lightning at P, T, quiet at P plus delta P, T plus delta T. Okay. If that's a, then it would print such sentences such as whenever lightning at P, T, thunder at P plus delta P, T plus delta T. So this is... Um, through this 
series of inscriptions. Okay, so what, what, what is unfolding through the wiring diagram are the instructions that generate these ins this series of inscriptions in the robot wiring diagram is a representation of a representation or a model, if you will, of the robot's world, its environment. Okay. Um, so in a way, like all organisms need some kind of representational system in order to be able to map the world around them. And this is the function of representation. Oh. So then the crucial distinction then becomes between signification, which is semantic and non-govern and, and properly conceptual, um, and um, representation, representation or mapping. So in other words, it's one thing to know things about the world and to be able to think about the world, and it's another thing to be able to find your way about the world on the basis of what you think. But you need two different accounts to articulate these levels. In the order of significance, in the, in, the, in the conceptual dimension, or the order of signification, let's say the inscription, this inscription on the tape part of the four, uh, the four dots, can be said to signify lightning uh, and the pattern, you know, the pattern it, we see in square belts 915 can be said to signify lightning at place 9 at time 15. Um, what is it to say that something signifies? Or what is, you know, signification here just means meaning. If you say that this linguistic expression means this, according to Sellers, what, what you're doing is you're establishing a functional equivalence between a quoted expression in a foreign language or so, some kind of uh, um, unfamiliar linguistic expression and a familiar expression of your own language. In other words, you're pointing to this sign or inscription in this unfamiliar um, you know, tongue and saying it plays the same role in this uh, symbolic system as this expression here with which we assume uh, our interlocutor is already familiar. Okay, So in order to say what something signifies, you have to show what an expression in your home language does. Okay, So for instance, if you say that, um, you know, if you say that, um, Éclair in French means lightning in French. Okay, someone you can, you know, the point of that, that's uh, an informative claim insofar as someone who does, doesn't understand French, you're taking this sound or this inscription in French, which your, your auditor doesn't understand, and you're saying it does, it plays exactly the same role in French as lightning does, okay, when I say it and mean it in English. Okay. So this is what it means to establish a functional equivalence between the robot sign design and the English sign design likely, as well as one between the, this other robot sign design and the English expression of lightning at place 9 and time 15. So this um, maps in a way, picture, but this a map is an orientation system which allows uh, a system to um, orient itself in the world by picturing, picturing uh, certain features or aspects of the world. Okay, again, this is a one uh, problem, one of the concepts I think which has been much misunderstood and uh, I think unfairly kind of dismissed. Um, but I think it's particularly um, you know, particularly helpful if one wants to kind of show, in fact, it's, it's indispensable if one, one, under, one wants to understand how rules are embedded in the causal order. So picturing does not consist in a relation of resemblance between representation and represented. It consists in the structural equivalence between properties of relations among representations considered as natural objects and properties among represented objects. So 
there's a systematic correlation between tokenings of the Robotis, Lightning, Eclair, and Lightning in Robotis, French and English, and instances of Lightning in the world. Um, but the point, again, this is, uh, I think, a crucial nuance. The point is that Sellers describes picturing as a second order isomorphism. It's not an isomorphism between two objects. It's an isomorphism between two systems of objects, okay? between relations. As a system of objects consists of is a system of relation. It, to call picturing a second order isomorphism is to say that it's a relation of relation. Okay. Um, so there are matter of factual, and these relations can be understood as matter of factual properties relating particular occurrences of these inscriptions and vocalizations to particular occurrences of lightning. This system of relations constitutes pattern in the causal order, and it is this pattern which incarnates the rule. Okay, and now um, I think, what, and actually what I want to kind of uh, conclude with is um, I think a possible contrast between patterns and processes. Um, I think uh, Johanna will have much more to say about this um, this afternoon, but um, I think I'm, incre I'm increasingly convinced that there is a really significant distinction between patterns and processes in the Sellers' work. A pattern is a complex mosaic of matter of factual relations. But if Sellers insists the work consists of things and not facts, then patterns are not processes, at least insofar as Sellers is, seems to be, you know, committed to a process ontology, um, an ontology of what he calls absolute processes. Um, I'm assuming here that absolute processes don't have propositional form. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know. I might be wrong about this. Uh, but patterns, insofar as they're composed of object-bound relations, um, seem to have that you know they're um, statable. Okay, you can uh, you can describe a pattern in terms of a series of facts. Um, you know the facts which instantiate this pattern, um, and these facts are object bound in that they consist of relations amongst objects, amongst well individuated objects in space and time. Um, and it seems that, or at least you know, um, it's not obvious that processes can be what Sellers explicitly says that processes are not object bound. Absolute processes cannot be um, attached um, or delimited in terms of objects or relations of objects. Um, okay. Um, well, that's. I think I sh I'll stop. That's, um, I'll just stop here. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so uh, first, thank you to all the speakers for accepting to come and uh, speak today. And I uh, thank you, Ray, for this uh, excellent talk. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, on... Uh, for, on on this on this final kind of point that you made actually because it relates to um, something I've been thinking about for a while and, and, and my research which is based on on noise and uh, so so the distinction you made there just uh, just just now between the pattern and process is 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 uh, is something I've been thinking about because if we think about uh, uh, well a pattern um, can be thought can be understood as a regularity. Uh, and in the uh, e even if it's a very complex one, like you're saying here in this kind of mosaic of of, of matter of factual relations, um, uh, whereas uh, we could think of uh, uh, you know non non periodicities in in uh, in um, you know material relations between things, which would be kind of uh, uh, 
perhaps not so uh, not statable as facts in the same in the same way. Um, so uh, I you know I wonder whether kind of you know we could say at the at the limit you know uh, a the, if, of uh, of of the this of calling something a pattern there must be something which is not pattern which would therefore just be process uh and, and uh you know which, which couldn't be decomposed into a for, into a set of regularities so um then i thought uh, i mean one of the things I, I i would like to kind of just to to situate where our our speakers here today in in, in some way if i may which is I think there's, I, th I think there's a kind of a, a, a broad agreement uh, amongst the speakers here, but, but that, that, for example, there's, uh, 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 they all, re they all reject a kind of simple computationalist picture of the of cognition, uh, and uh, and you know, or uh, uh, and move beyond it, uh, its description in terms of mechanistic causality. Um, so. But there's a there's a, I think a range of of of, of ways that, that that has taken by the different speakers here today, and I think so. Uh, uh, Giuseppe Longo is is uh, is uh, uh, has has written very strongly against the computationalist paradigm, uh, and uh, um, um, has used uh, the uh, has drawn on the the fact of uh, multi-scale randomness at, ma at many layers in order to do so and so uh he's arguing that uh that there is for example in 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 processes like biological evolution or economic systems they are that the the processes are so complex that they cannot be given entailing laws Okay, so they can't they can't be uh, modelled as uh, as uh, an NK landscape with a, as an NK, an NP complete problem, for example. So they're not algorithmically searchable or, or definable. Now, on 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 the other side, I think uh, you know uh, Johanna Seibt uh, and 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 Ray to some degree are are arguing that there is a certain you know that that that. That there is not a necessary fundamental limits to the computational possibilities of decomposing those functions, so that there, so that it is possible to to uh, to to decompose those inferential strategies uh, and to to automate them in some senses. Uh, now, um, in in some way this uh, this you know well let's take uh let, let's take um uh a, a, an example of uh you know of course uh, kind of biological biological um systems such as a, a, a fish its movement is unpredictable uh but we we can we can still fish catch fish right because they they they've got a regularity to their movement right they've got pattern governed behavior which we can regularly rely on, you know, with nets and 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 so on. But uh, but when it comes to uh, complex systems, which involving higher co higher cognitive animals, then then it's a much more diff di different problem, uh, and involves um, you know, uh, for example, um, uh, p the p performativity of the model, the counter performative counter performativities, and a complex kind of uh, array of these effects of, of the of the inferential practices involved in 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 that in that process. So then, uh, I think, yeah, you know, when it when it comes to uh, to kind of the the uh, the problems of prediction today and the way that they are they're being unfolded in in say uh, uh ais on on the uh, in, in on the internet um there's uh there's a um there, there's a real uh it, it, it's really well as as Giuseppe Longo argues this is a, a frame problem rather than an mp complete problem so the 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 it, it it is a matter of defining the context within which a probability probability distribution unfolds rather than 
uh, rather than searching a, a, an already configured space. Okay, so the space, because the, because the space of possibilities are constantly changing and constantly in flux, the parameters are constantly changing, then we can't say, we can't give uh, uh, a, a, a full list of all the possibilities of the states. So what we need is to, uh, to, to define the context for the operation of that. And I think that's what, exactly what's happening in rule governs behavior rather than, uh, r rather than pattern, uh, sorry, rule obeying behavior rather than pattern, pattern governed behavior. So it's the definition of a context for action, which would be uh, eff effectively a solution to the frame problem. So, uh, so, yeah. In 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 in, uh, in conclusion, I'd, I'd I'd just like to kind of bring up the questions of randomness, contingency, and noise with regards to the main uh, items of debate today, which are prediction, process, and reason, and uh, hope that we can articulate some kind of relations between them as we go throughout the day. Do you know to respond or we have some uh, do we have maybe ten minutes for a question? You would like to go for a question straight away. Okay. Do you mind? Okay. Uh one there, so uh what's your name? David and then do something. Oh sorry. Sorry for recording for thanks. I was interested in Nico's comment about computational tractability that will be mentioned as well. Um, via the kind of rewiring sellers via Brown, and this one of the things that Brown takes from Davidson is, is the point that no stain is simply just going to have an inferential role. It's going to, this inferential world going to depend on all sorts of auxiliary commitments. You know, what we believe about the world will determine what book can be inferred for brother. So you need some kind of update algorithm, if you like, whenever you're dealing with up with speakers. And of course, that, that could be really complicated. It's how do you figure out one kind of using to treat it to other people, even what you've already attributed to them. That could actually be a really complex process. And it, it's not clear that that's attractive. Obviously, an algorithm could be computation, computable, but not track. You know, arranging all the permutations of further things is perfect. You can state the algorithm. You know, there are just too many possibilities to actually compute. Like, I guess there is a thing to do with computational track to them, have given that clause and granting of the kind of function synaptics. Okay, so so I mean, um, there. When you say it's not algorithmically tractable, so it wouldn't be possible then to articulate the inference and something like a, a kind of yes, a kind of a, a reinforce something that is kind of simply algorithmically yes. Uh, and I, I think there's an issue there simply because of the the, the complexity of interpreting. Up yes, sorry. Yeah, that's all. I'm not. I don't know over it. I like. I, uh, I don't know it can be. In uh, Brands, in some way, goes through a sort of describes a procedure that the speaker has to adopt in imputing commitments to other speakers and so and eliminating certain inferences on the basis of other beliefs they have. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. Yes, and it's not. You know, it's not clear whether we could write a program to do that. So, I guess that, that's a security or something to put Um Yes, I mean, I think... Look, I mean, I think... Uh, what is powerful, I think, or still kind of powerful about this account is that, um, or at least, you know, the Solarian version that I find quite compelling is that um, the you know uh, the pattern governed disposition that you know 
speakers need to acquire in order to be able to think, you know, to speak and think, um, are not, um, you know, they are just kind of, they are a set of cultural contingencies. Okay, they're, they're going to be contingent uh, because of, you know, biological, historical, and cultural um, circumstances. Um, so there's no, now whether, I mean, so there's no claim that these, so in other words, these are only kind of, you know, I guess, and you can correct me about this if I'm wrong, but I guess they, these will only be algorithmically decomposable in some kind of trivial sense in which anything is. So it's not, they're, they're not kind of, um, um, because of the primacy of material inference in this account, um, a material, you know, what generates um, a material inference is simply a habit, okay? A kind of the acquiring a habit. But if if we're going to make sense of our speakers, then definitely words, that's going to have to be a cube of context in Sicily. Because, yeah, so, but I asked Ted Dudges if it misses Malagrol, so this is a nice arrangement of epit epitaphs. You've got a kind of interpret her meaning in, in the light of the situation or in rather in terms of some standard kind of rule governing the whole thing. Ah, ah, but I think, okay, this is an important, I think once you understand rules, I mean, rules are context. This is why in a way the ability to understand a rule is not necessarily itself conceptually tractable. You can't break it down into a series of instructions. The whole point about norms of functionalism is that rules can't be decomposed into a set of propositional statements because it's know-how. It's a kind of know-how, so it's always, you know, it's it's highly context-sensitive and context-dependent. This is why, so it's the kind of the old riding a bike example, you know. So in a way, knowing how to reason, knowing what to say is like riding a bike in that it's an incredibly, it's, it's a kind of uh, accumulation of an incredibly complicated you know, set of kind of um, if, you know, um, circumstances, um, but although when you know these philosophers give example, they always say as if you know you you kind of exemplify a rule propositionally by saying in circumstance when in circumstance C do A, um, but it's not clear in fact whether you know rules are um, can be propositionally encapsulated, and the whole point is that you don't need to rehearse a series of propositions to follow a rule. That's the basic claim. And so in that sense, I think it's it's not so kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of, I think it's kind of a, recognizes the same difficulty with classic kind of, you know, rule-based accounts. Um, this epic. Well, thanks, Corey. Phil, um, I think you, we are being uh, presenting the session that here in the theory, language, and language in a very effective way. And this is a very critical distinction. In mathematics and mathematics alone, they could really help and work. But in no way is intrinsic, it is objective, it's strongly contextual, and it both very often in the crucial cases both that it appears. And in Hilbert first, in 904, thought he had proved the consistency of arithmetic with main conjecture in 1900 by a group by induction. That point carried fully. Well, you know, clear proving the consistency of arithmetic by induction, which is the fundamental axiom of arithmetic. So super right. Then Hilbert told, I do that in the meta theory. The best one, the notion was invented. He said, I'm going to prove by meta induction the consistency of arithmetic which contains induction. Then Herman Bayer told me, What do you know, Professor? So Hilbert, who was a student at the time, was very respectful. Make up theoretic induction is actually theoretic induction because in the same mathematical stuff. And indeed, this is what Goethe did. What he did is that he showed that the meta theory of arithmetic, which contains the notion of probability, which is a meta theoretical notion, can be fully encoded in the theory. So the meta theory by Goethe's proof is a subset of the theory. Anytime you ever think it up, a formulation, anytime you have a formal theory in mathematics that includes arithmetic, this theory can encode and as contained as a subset 
it's time it is the meta theory that's the core of Bibel's proof. So as soon as you have finite of descriptions and your theory meta theory, I think finite of description and your theory is powerful enough to contain arithmetic, the distinction totally disappears. As soon as your rules are written with suppositional fatistic action, they belong to the theory by including. So it may have fifth no difference to say, for example, I write my notes in Italian as meta theoretic remarks on my English Triton. That's right on B for distinction. But you must be aware that it totally disappears when it works at the formal level. And in other contexts, they may have different meanings. Okay. That's not okay. Oh, uh, I thought you could have the question. No, that was the question. Okay. Um, uh, well, w okay, one thing I'll say. Um, Put it on your mic. Um, two things. One is that this, you know, as I, as I understand them, Sellers is not, I mean, the whole point is that this, um, in a way, the kind of the boundary between levels is, uh, seems to be porous in some way. Uh, it's not clear insofar as in a way he's saying that the ability I mean whether you want to call it you know m maybe it's misleading to characterize it in terms of like object and you know object meta you know first order second order um, because in fact I think what he's interested in is a kind of reflexivity um, or a kind of involution where um, patterns I guess um Certain patterns become, um, I guess, you know, kind of embedded and nested within one another. Now, I don't know if that's, um, I mean, it, it, in his account, the only, you know, the work that's done by the distinction is explaining how you can um, treat, um, you know, treat something on one stratum of language as um, as a mere, you know, as if it was a, a perceptual object, as a, as a mere kind of inscription in terms of its kind of perceptible properties. Um, and then there's a kind of a, a, you know, the use mentioned distinction also does some work uh, in this argument. Um, now, Okay, so I mean, do you think, therefore, that do you think that every distinction, so, well, simply, do you think that reflexivity as such um, is beholden to this, you know, to this kind of bad kind of stratification that you think is redundant? No. Uh, on that side, I think it's been technically very useful and keeps being useful all the time, but be messy aware that according to the context, there is no section external role of the meta here with respect to the tune. As soon as you are in fanatistic linguistic frames, and as soon as your theory is back as powerful enough, the meta theory may be included in, may be encoded in. That's what I'm saying. Each grieves reflexivity within the theory. Mm -hmm. That's the trick of good. Exactly that my dad. He writes a, a formula saying, I am not provable. Is it encoded in arithmetic? And then it is not provable. But the notion of provoking is meta trait. So indeed, he enforces the flexibility. He brings at one level the power of the flexibility due to the existence of pretending existence of two levels. It's even stronger of them saying. But we handle this in legal depth. It's quite normal to reflect ourselves to access sort of securities. Life is all of that. And in Norway, it's almost everything is correlated to almost everything. There is no probable level which is distinct from the local level. The local level is causally related, intricate to the global level. These sorts of reflexivities are everywhere. But we cannot detangle them in an artificial led way by saying, for example, in biology, I totally distinguish the molecular level from the organismal level. No, because there is no molecular cascade that is causally independent from the global level and vice versa. So we have to face these reflexivities all the time. Okay. Okay, thanks. I have a question from John. Can you ask this? Okay. 
perhaps more of um, also comp a question. Um, as I was listening, I'm sorry, a mate. Uh, mm -hmm. So listening, I think that may be being from this understanding uh, in the following sense. Mathematical objects have identity criteria that are very well defined, functional equivalence, so very strict equivalence of functional role. Uh, but Sellers uh, trick of a distinction between the object language and the meta language is of course precisely in order to point out that the inferential role of anything that is at the object language is different from the inferential role of the same item once it is articulated at the meta level. So there's simply no identity of the functionality of the two expressions. And uh, I see Sellers very much in, in, in the historical dimension, I don't know uh, where you would uh, throw that in. Um, one must not forget that these texts were written at uh, 1953. And um, uh, at that time, developmental psychology was on the rise and people discovered that it takes children some time to acquire the normative discourse. So uh, this is a kind of philosophical theory of language that is very close to empirical research in developmental psychology and is supposed to bring out um, the interest in fact that we first acquire our everyday observational language and only later in life we acquire normative discourse, modal discourse, mental discourse. And Sella simply wanted to make the point that you stressed um, maybe then we never get out of the pattern gamut behavior. Practice is, is what it all remains, even though we gain the illusory expression, impression that we are talking about um, qualia and uh, conscious state and mental states and thoughts as something that is very different from, um, from anything that could apply to be acquired in pattern gamut behavior. So I think my, my question, if I should formulate it into a question is, um, the, the notion of a meta game, that is something that, which you said that in relation to the meta language. I mean, the relationship between being a meta game and or defining it. Um, yes, I, it took me, I mean, I spent years trying to understand this distinction and uh, I'm still, you know, I'm far from confident that I understand it. Um, precise, I mean, he introduces the kind of, uh, I mean, he begins by saying that what seems to motivate the distinction initially is to say that there's a difference between that the, um, a, on the one hand, a game is defined by its rules. Okay, that's a minimal kind of, that's a, you know, the, what individuates a, a game is the rules. Um, but when, and although every move playing the game is obviously kind of um, determined uh, by those rules, the rules themselves are not part of the game. The rules themselves are not part of the game in the sense in which the objects with which you play the game are. So, for instance, when you play football, you know, you play with, like, you know, there's grass there, there's men in shorts running around, a white ball, goalposts, but those are all the objects. There's nothing, you know, they're playing football, but the rules of football are not kind of, you know, part of the apparatus that is being manipulated or that is in the game um I, t I mean so I think that that I mean as I understand it that's what seller seems to, wants to be getting at um so maybe I mean I think maybe the, the the distinction is unhelpful because I think he ends up saying it's almost as if you know the the distinction is it's not really maybe it's unhelpful maybe it's actually a kind of an unhelpful distinction because it encourages you to think that, or encourages one to think that there is this, you know, this hierarchy, and it's not clear that it is. It's not clear, and because, well, as you say, that there is a difference between the functional rule of expressions in, you know, 
at one level and its functional role at another. Um, but then maybe talking about in terms of, you know, the kind of levels is, is maybe that's, maybe it's context more than levels, but I don't know. I don't have, I, you know, I struggle to understand that distinction and, um, I can, I can, I can get a sense of the, what sellers is trying to get from it, but I think, well, obviously it leads to, if you, if you took it, if you reify it and kind of turn it into some kind of, you know, fundamental distinction, then you know, it seems to me all sorts of difficulties would ensue. But um Okay, thank you very much. I think we have a break of fifteen minutes to have a coffee and then come back for this episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.